This podcast is not intended to provide any investment advice. The opinions expressed here by either the hosts or guests do not necessarily reflect the views of PSA, Collectors Holdings, or any of their affiliates. Any discussion of collectible values in the past or present is not a guarantee of future performance. Hello and welcome to The Index. My name is Chris McGill and I'm here with Ryan Green. The Index discusses the hobby from the vantage point of price data and market trends provided by Cardletter. Here's the rundown. First, we overview notable auction prices realized over the last month, and then we discuss market swings, both by player and by card. So Ryan, let's get started. Let's. Chris, good to have you back. This is our, uh, this is our first time chatting since the National. You all recovered by now? Yeah, uh, got sick like I think most other people did. That's three three straight nationals, three straight illnesses. But it's it's worth it's worth it. It's worth it to get to be there. It really is. I uh, I avoided getting sick after the twenty twenty two national when it felt like everybody I went with did, and then this year I was not so lucky. But again, a trade off you make to go to the hobby Super Bowl, and the national wasn't the only thing happening in the hobby in July, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Here on this episode of the Index, looking back at July and and Chris, as we always do, we're going to start talking about a few really notable auction sales from last month, uh, and just discuss their impact on the hobby. So, what do we want to start with from July 2023? Yes, this month we will be talking about three notable auctions from July of 2023. The first one I've got for us is the 2021 Prism card number 331, Trevor Lawrence, Black Finite One of One. PSA 6. It sold for the nice round even number of $150,000. Some background and facts about this sale on this card. This is the second highest public selling T-Law card on record. The first highest was his 2021 National Treasures RPA Platinum Shield 1 of 1, which has sold twice. Most recently, it sold for $264,000 in March. So that card little higher on the T-Law hierarchy. This card, the Black Finite One of One, is notable in part because it's the rarest parallel in the 2021 Prism Football base set. There are 44 total parallels, and the Black Finite is the only one of one. Now, for comparison's sake, to sort of situate this price for T-Law among some of his peers, the 2021 Prism Black Finite one of one of your guy, Ryan, Justin Fields, and my guy too, but not as much, sold for 90000 in November of last year. So T-Law, 150, JF1, 90000 just for comparison's sake. And a final note here on T-Law, the football player. He was recently ranked by his peers in the NFL's annual Top 100 Players list. 96th, the 96th best player in the NFL. And for what it's worth, he finished 15th in QBR last season. So there's a bunch of facts and tidbits on this card and the player and the market. What stands out to you, Ryan, about this sale? Well, first off on that last note about him being ranked 96th, it was really crazy to me because I respect the top 100 rankings because they're fully voted on by NFL players and coaches. Somehow, Trevor, I'm a Justin Fields fan and collector, like you said, and I'm surprised that he was 10 spots ahead of Lawrence. Um, I believe Fields checked in at number 86. And, you know, this really made me wonder, like, do the players maybe, are they sleeping a little bit on T-Law still? Um, you know, does a number one pick with the pedigree he came in with from college, like, just have more to prove before guys fully buy in? But man, like the sales data backs it up. Like the hobby believes in this guy as they should. And I mean, the black finite one of one prism, you know, I think if you get away from the autos and the shields, I mean, there's no question that's the card. It's the number one card to have of a guy in ultra modern era. Correct. I completely agree. And I love how for the first 10 years of prism football the black finite one of one was the only pack issued 
one of one parallel to the base set. Now, 2012 did have the pylon one of one, but that didn't come from the hobby boxes and the the pack that was. I believe that card was redeemed, or was or or came out of special Panini online packs. It it didn't come from the hobby boxes. So, but but then this year, Prism broke that streak for football, and now they had three black one of ones, black stars, black shimmer, and black finite, which I don't love. But for but for T Law and for his class, this is the King Prism card, undisputed, black finite one of one. It's it's really just a masterpiece of a card. It is. And you know, some people might scoff at the PSA six a little bit. I don't even think it matters. Um it, on a card like this, uh, this is the one to have. And like you said, I think there's some cachet that this was the final year where Panini only had one black one of one in prison football. Cause like you said, this year you had the black shimmer that was in the first off the line product. You had the uh, black stars, one of ones, which came sealed in top loaders as part of a uh, premium box set. Um, so, I mean, even with those now, like the black finite one of ones still holds that cachet. And I'll tell you what, like the timing of this sale is really interesting because I don't think there's a quarterback a young quarterback who's buzzier going into the 2023 season than Trevor Lawrence. Like the expectations are high. They are Ryan. And if I were surveying the landscape of quarterbacks to prospect for this upcoming season, I look at the AFC and I see Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, Lamar Jackson, Tua, T-Law, and and even more that aren't coming to mind right now. I mean, the AFC is just loaded with quarterback talent. And then I look at the NFC, and you've got Jalen Hurts, who I think is the consensus best quarterback in the NFC right now. You've got Jared Goff, you know. You've got uh, Brock Purdy, maybe, if he's healthy and ready to go. I mean, if I were looking at quarterbacks, like, doesn't Jalen Hurts actually just – he looks great right now. I mean, how good that team was last year. It just, that's, I, I, I look at T-Law and I'm like, man, I love T-Law, but you're going to have to probably get, go through some combination of those elite quarterbacks to get to the Super Bowl. That's going to be really tough. Well, for our second notable auction to talk about this month, let's turn back the clock a little bit. We, we went ultra modern. So now we're going to go into modern with a nineties piece here that really made some waves. Yeah, well, this guy was walking the floor of the National. It was amazing to see him in the hobby with us. It's Derek Jeter. It's the 1996 Select Certified Card Number 100 Mirror Gold Out of 30 PSA 10. It sold for $288,000. This card is a Pop 2 with 16 total instances appearing in the PSA Population Report but only two tens. The prior sale of this card was $202,000 about four years ago, which means that this card has increased about 42.5% over the last four years. This is the fifth highest Jeter sale on record, but the four previous highs were all copies of the 93 SP Foil PSA 10. So this is Jeter's officially his second highest selling card ever. Now, some information about this product. In 1996, Pinnacle produced Select Certified Baseball. It was the second year of Select Certified Baseball, and Pinnacle designed the product to be its super premium brand and to compete with Topps Finest Baseball. And so Pinnacle stated that the print run for this Mirror Gold Parallel, which was the rarest of the six parallels to the base set, was limited to 30 copies, but they did not number the card. But they stated that the print run was 30, and the tiny population reports seem to support that that's an accurate number. And the Mirror Gold is the rarest of the six parallels to the base set. So six parallels, I mean, in the mid-90s, that was a lot. And credit to BaseballCardpedia.com for that background information on the set. Final tidbit here about Jeter. It's always of, of interest to me to see sort of when a player has a card selling for a quarter million dollars, like where does that player rank historically in the canon of baseball greats? And Jeter most recently was ranked 
the 28th best player of all time by an ESPN panel. That list was published in 2022. So the 28th best player of all time, according to ESPN, an, an iconic and very important set from the mid nineties, 288,000 for the PSA 10 ride. Yeah, these uh these high end nineties inserts, my goodness. I know, I know, you know, so many people talk about vintage and just uh, you know, the value in, in vintage that's just locked in. I think we're beyond the point now where we can say the same from some of these super rare hits from the nineties and super rare parallels. Um, where these are becoming, you know, equally the card to have just for different reasons. Like you know, the, the 93 SP foil rookie is the most iconic of Jeter, but it's, but it's not necessarily rare. Um, it's rare in a PSA 10 grade, but this mirror gold, this is just straight up rare. I think people who are real like rarity hunters, I mean, these nineties inserts and nineties parallels are going to hold up over time, probably just as well as some of the most iconic flagship rookies. Yep, I think that's fair. And I think one of the things about those mid to late 90s parallels is not only are they so desirable because of how limited they were in terms of the print run, but they are just beautiful. And that that applies to the 93 SP foil as well. But this 96 mirror gold, I mean, the card is just, it's a stunning work of sports card art. And, and that's one of the things that I love the most about the 90s especially in the mid to late 90s those cards are just stunning man just bums me out that 96 uh select certified mirror golds from football were not as rare because i have a handful of those i've got got a i've got a couple of the terrell davis mirror gold rookie uh yeah that one's not worth nearly as much that might have been 95 but that was uh yeah yeah that was 95 select certified but not nearly as rare but still is just as beautiful so for sure Let's talk a little bit of vintage as we uh, wrap up some of the most notable sales from July 2023. What was the big one that stood out for you? This sale was remarkable. It was the 1970 Tops card number 123, Pete Maravich, PSA 10, Pistol Pete's rookie card. $552,000 realized at auction for this card. Now, that's over half a million dollars, okay? That is a truly you know, seismic sale for a 1970s basketball card. And this particular one is a population two of 3,851 grades in the PSA pop report. This, there have only been two tens issued. This is the only public sale of one of those PSA tens. And I'm gathering this information from card ladders historical sales database which goes back to the early 2000s so there have been no public sales of this card for 20 years until this one came out this is obviously the highest pistol pete sale of all time now for comparison's sake the psa 9 of this card which is a pop 85 which is pretty low as well that last sold for twenty one thousand dollars. so there's basically a 25 26 x multiplier in between the pop two PSA 10 and the pop 85 PSA nine that that shows how desired those PSA 10 copies are of these uh of, of these of these masterpieces of hall of fame caliber basketball players so this is not only the highest pistol Pete sale ever this is the highest sale of a 1970s tops card ever some of the other key rookies from that 70 top set are Pat Riley and Calvin Murphy both of whom now are in executive roles in the NBA, which is interesting to note. 1970 was the third major Topps basketball release. The previous two were 1957, which we talked about on a, on a recent episode, very important basketball issue, 57 Topps, and then 1969. And so then this was the third Topps basketball release. And on Maravich as the player, as the historical figure, he was recently ranked the 54th best player of all time per ESPN's top 75 list from last summer. So Ryan, half a million dollar sale of Pistol Pete, man. What do you think about this? Ah, it's amazing. Um, I, I, one of the things I love about the vintage basketball cards and vintage tops is 
something you pointed out there about, we've talked about it on the show before, the, the weird lineage of these old Topps basketball sets about how there were these big, long gaps. Um, I think that just adds to the unique rarity desire of cards like this. Um, obviously, this one's super cool for other reasons. I think, you know, like you said, people who know the historical significance of Pete Maravich, especially college basketball fans like me, I mean, he's probably a top 10 all-time college basketball player in, in the history of college basketball. Um, you know, it's, it's a tall boy. It's in, that, it's in that tall boy holder. Just so many unique things about this card. And I'll tell you what, like, as someone who's started to really, like, dive in more on vintage, um, the thing that really stood out to me about this copy seeing it is it's amazing how a lot of vintage, you know, tops cards, the color could fade over years, depending on like how much it was displayed out in the open and you know, where it was stored. This thing looks like it was printed yesterday. So, I mean, you talk about how much eye appeal matters with vintage. This thing is like immaculate. Yeah. It's a beautiful cop. It's, uh, it's absolutely a card that I think almost any of us would just, we'd be head over heels to own a card of that caliber. It's just, it's stunning. Just another reminder that I need to keep buying vintage. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so that's been the notable sales from July, 2023. We're going to take a really quick break here. We'll be back. Chris and I will be talking about rising and falling player indexes and cards of note from July. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hey guys, while we take a quick break here from this week's episode, I figured I'd take a moment to share a quick hobby fun fact with you. Did you know that there are 30 million raw cards available on ComC right now? And for those of you not yet in the know, ComC is shorthand for Check Out My Collectibles, a marketplace and hobby favorite for surfacing ungraded cards. So on the PSA pod, why am I sitting here telling you about this marketplace platform? Well, because there are 30 million raw cards available on ComC, that means there are 30 million reasons for a direct to PSA partnership to now exist. And now one does. Submit any card for PSA grading now straight from your ComC inventory with just a few clicks. That's right, PSA and ComC have partnered up and you can leave all of the shipping and paperwork details to us as we're offering you yet another convenient solution for grading your raw cards with PSA. Whether you're building sets to compete in the PSA set registry, stocking up on big name QBs ahead of the 2023 NFL season, trying to catch all the Pokemon you can, whatever you collect, as you add it to your PC raw from ComC, grading with PSA is now easier than ever. For more information, visit psacard.com and click the ComC partnership banner at the top of the page to learn more about this unique partnership and to get started taking advantage of it today. Now, back to the show. All right, we're back here. The July 2023 Index, Ryan Green, Chris McGill from Card Ladder. We just talked about notable sales from um, last month in the hobby outside of the national. I mean, goodness, there was transacting going on left and right uh, at the national. It's always one of the most fun things to see come out of that show is just some of those big deals that just make waves on the, on the uh, show floor. But we're going to move on. Uh, talking about rising and falling player indexes and rising and falling cards based on what Chris has seen in the card ladder data from the last month. So Chris, let's start with rising player index. Fans of football, this won't be a surprise. Lionel Messi, his index in card ladder is up 10% over the last month, which is a large percentage change but not as big as the ones that we usually showcase in this section. But it, it, it is significant because of the sheer size of his card letter index. There's 137 cards in his card letter index. So a movement of 10%, you know, over the period of a month, granted that a lot of those cards probably haven't had a chance to sell, you know, that, what that, and, and the methodology of the index presumes that prices are static. So for, a, for, a car un, until they sell again. So for a card to move up or for an index to move up 10% means there were some really big movers within that, that cluster, that hundred and 
uh, 37 card cluster that makes up his index. And in fact, there were. So one of the cards driving the uptick was his 2004 Panini Sports Mega Cracks Barca Campione number 35. The PSA 10 of this card sold for $8,800 in May, and then it most recently sold for $12,500 in July. So that card in, in that grade, but also in lower grades, is part of the the inner workings of his index that's that's driving it up in value. And I mean, for that card to go from 8,800 to 12,500, that's an increase of 40, 45 ish percent, just kind of doing the math off the top of my head there. So index as a whole is up 10 percent. We're seeing key cards of his go up by quite a bit. And I'm no soccer fan, okay? I don't really pay much attention to the sport, but I have collector friends of Messi who are sending me his highlights. They're showing me his first appearance playing here stateside, and he he scored a goal in the final minutes of his first game. And so I mean, people are really excited for Messi, Ryan, and, and the card market's reflecting that. You know what's really fascinating is, I mean, obviously he's a, he's a goat, right? So, like, the prices are locked in in a lot of ways you don't like you said you don't see a ton of movement um there's not a lot left he can do that can move his market but here in the course of less than a year we saw him not only break through and win the world cup for the first time you know we keep hearing in the united states how you know soccer is growing in popularity and you know we see it in the hobby like soccer cards are growing in popularity um but man like i feel like the World Cup made an impact on his uh, on him in the hobby here in the U.S., but oddly enough, him coming to MLS might have even had a bigger impact because people can now like watch, like see, touch, feel the action of him, you know, not happening at two o'clock on a Wednesday halfway across the world. It's literally happening in prime time here in the U.S., playing in different cities in the U.S. and like you see the ticket prices surging everywhere that uh, Miami FC is playing. It's like, this is real impact on the American market. Yeah. And it was a little bit unexpected too. I think there was almost a sense of Messi is entering the twilight of his career. There's really not much to speculate on or, or prospect on at this point in terms of adding to his legacy or adding to his, his uh, level of fame. But I think that's proven to be at least partially incorrect because one of the things that has captivated people about Messi's appearance is who comes out to watch him play. And in part, part of that is because, you know, this is taking place during the summer and people are from football and basketball are in their off season and summer is just seen as more of a time to travel and do things of a more leisurely nature. But, you know, LeBron James going out and attending his games and then embracing him on the field afterwards. I think that adds a different level of credibility in front of the domestic United States audience that he might not have necessarily had, at least not amongst casuals like myself. And then we see something like that happen and it's like, all right, this, this, there is a different level of validation going on. That's been made possible by Messi coming to the MLS. And he can still play at an elite level, which like you were mentioning, like a lot of older players, you know, global stars have come to MLS before for big paydays at the end of their career, but it's kind of been labeled as a retirement league for them because, you know, they've maybe fallen off, but yeah, he's still got plenty in the tank. Well, let's talk about a falling player index. This one's really interesting when you put this on here and I was reading about it. So I'm, I'm going to let you take it away here. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, this, this index had a seismic drop and I'm confident it won't be the first drop that we see in this index. And it, and it certainly isn't the end in any way, shape or form of movements in this index in the upward direction either. But the player uh, is Victor Wembanyama, and his index is down 51% over the last month which is just you know i mean that's an enormous amount and it sounds scary and it is to some extent i mean granted we're only tracking 11 Wembenyama cards okay so this index is is heavily influenced by the the handful of cards that we are tracking but to give an example of what's going on underneath the hood in this index so Wemby's 2023 slam deck collection equipes de france psa 10 Okay, that's one of his, you know, key rookie cards out there right now. Uh, this was a pop 58 when Wembenyama made his summer league debut 
on Friday, July 7th of this summer. And at that time, the card was selling for about $675. Now, today, this is a little over a month later when we're recording, the card is only selling for $290. All right, so from $675 down to $290, and the population has exploded. It was 58 at that at, at, at the time of his summer league debut, and now it's 147. So not quite a tripling, but almost. I think that though there's two factors here at play that uh, that are that are evergreen collector lessons that that we get any time a very exciting player comes in and his cards show up and the hobby goes crazy for them is that the first one is that once that player steps foot on the court, on the floor, on the field, once they actually get in the game, that's when we all take a seat. You know, you know, like when you go to basketball games and for certain teams, like like for the Denver Nuggets, I went to a few games this year in Ball Arena, and we we stand in the audience, we all stand until the Nuggets score, and then we sit down and we settle in. And now we say, okay, now we're going we're gonna to sit here and we're going to calm down and we're going to take the ride from here. Same thing in the hobby. We're all standing on our feet. We're so excited. We're, there's so much, antici- so much anticipation for Wembenyama to step foot on the floor, to make basketball history. But then when he finally does and he finally goes out there on the floor, then we all sit down. We all calm down. We all buckle in for what's going to be a long ride. It's going to be a, a long, challenging climb to the top of the NBA, into NBA history books. And, and it sort of sinks in, and the anticipation turns into endurance. And now we wait. And, and, and during that point, I think some people decide, okay, you know, I'll sell my cards now. This was fun. I was excited. But now I'm sort of coming back to a more balanced point of view. So I think there is something of a sell-off that happens when a player first steps foot on the floor. But but then also, you know, the population aspect of this is so key too. I mean, when these cards first start coming out, we don't really know the print runs. They're not numbered. We don't know how many PSA 10s there's going to be. So there was 58. Now it's up to 147. You know, it's only natural that as, as as the population increases, the supply is going to increase. And that's going to drive prices down. So I, I think that's the two factors at play here for that particular Wembenyama card, Ryan. Yeah, and you know, you like you said, buckle in because there's going to be a lot of this. Um, you know, as soon as those first cards of him and you know the Spurs uniform come out, the first cards from you know hoops uh, this year, the first Prism rookie, you're going to see these waves and this fluctuation. And, and it's funny because we talk about what happened with the modern card market from 2021 to 2022. And now we're going to see like how much the market has matured uh, with top young prospects from what happened in that, you know, 18 month stretch in the hobby. I'm still super excited to see all these cards of his uh, come out. It's just, I, I think you just got to, be really, really thoughtful with how you're going to approach collecting his cards and when you're deciding to buy his cards. Because I'll tell you what, for as fun as the ride is going to be watching him, you know, we haven't had a generational prospect like this in the NBA come along since LeBron. And as much fun as it's going to be to watch that ride, you know, it's going to be equally an equal, I guess, uh, up and down ride probably in the hobby market as we go. Um, so I'm just curious to see how it how it all unfolds. But, you know, Chris, this is really the true test of the ultra modern hobby market because this is really the first generational prospect in any sport we've seen come along since the cooling of that ultra modern uh, card market you know, last, uh, in the last year or so. So it's going to be really fascinating. Yeah, it is. And it's going to be, we're already seeing signs that it's going to be unlike um any prospect i mean even though the market has uh corrected in a lot of ways it has cooled in a lot of ways but you know the market is is also just red hot for this guy i mean the tw- the 20 this is not a card that card letter is tracking but you can find this in sales history i just went to sales history i punched in Wembenyama, and then i sorted by highest price i mean his 2022 bowman u autograph gold out of 50 a psa 1010 Sold for sixteen grand two days ago on eBay, sixteen grand. I mean, you know, 
there is a level of anticipation and excitement for this player and these cards that certainly feels like we're back in the euphoria of 2020, 2021. And in many ways we are, you know I mean? That era was supercharged by its own suite of great players and prospects, whether it was Mahomes and Luca and Trey and those guys coming of age, or whether it was Zion Williamson and Morant and guys who, you know, were, were so touted and we were so, so excited to see them play. And then when they did play, they looked great too. But yeah, there's, there's no replacement. There's no substitute for the excitement that a prospect generates. And it can, it absolutely can. And historically it has reinvigorated, stimulated, turbocharged the hobby market. And when Benyama will, it's just, it's just unfortunate that his NBA licensed products are not going to have autographs. That's, that's tough. I wish there was a way that, that there could be a harmonious collaboration and we could get them, but that's beyond wishful thinking. But, but that's going to make for a really interesting market. And that's not unprecedented either. Ben Simmons was a very similar situation to this, where Simmons was an exclusive with somebody other than who was manufacturing the NBA licensed products. And there are friends, collectors of mine, historians of the hobby, if you will, who believe that it was Ben Simmons' rookie year, which didn't have the NTRPA and so forth, that elevated brands like Prism to the to the level that they're at now because that those pris the Prism Mojo and the Prism Gold and those cards were the 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 true they they the the hobby focused on them as the chase cards and it elevated those those brands that aren't centered around autograph cards. So maybe who knows? So I I think there's going to be some unpredictable consequences of the way that the Wembenyama hype is going to shake out. All right. Well, let's talk about rising and falling cards, individual cards from last month. And the riser uh, really caught my eye here uh, as a baseball guy. Chris, what do we got? This has been a dynamic hobby season for baseball. Um, from names like Corbin Carroll and Shohei Otani to the resurgence of the player who we're about to talk about, Acuna. His market, or I'm sorry, the card in question here is up 47% over the last month. It's the 2018 Tops card number 698, Acuna Bat Down PSA 10. It last sold for about $1,400 on July 30th. And a month prior, on June 30th, it was selling for $945. So that's about a 45, 50% appreciation over the span of a month which is substantial um and the population of that card is 615 so there's enough out there i believe at any given time on ebay you can find at least a few this card peaked at five thousand dollars in april of 2021 but it's worth noting that the population was about 450 back then when i look at the population growth chart on card ladder so a few more in the population today acuna from what I understand in my limited baseball knowledge is the front runner for NL MVP. Uh, it just seems like there's a new level of hobby excitement for Acuna this season. Which is good to see. And I think that's really good for ultra modern collectors. Cause this is a guy who, you know, during the 2020, 2021 hobby boom, you know, his cards just really overheated, you know, along with a lot of the market. Um, and then he, you know, he had a freak knee injury, suffered leaping for a ball at the wall towards ACL, you know, came back last season, but you know, was still shaking the rust off and, um, you know, his card suffered a little bit, but, uh, like you said, this is, this is promising that, you know, showing that guys can overcome things like that, overcome lulls, injuries and bounce back and have MVP type performances and the hobbies trust and, uh, and just love of those guys will follow suit. It's really cool to see this card bouncing back to now what is probably more of like a true value of it uh, versus what that comp was in uh, April 2021. But uh, really cool because even by ultra modern standards, you know, a pop of 615 on this short print in a PSA 10 is still relatively low. You know, like you said, you can find a couple of them at any given time on eBay. 
but they're not flooded out there. So, you know, this was, this really became the signature flagship rookie card of, uh, you know, collectors to aspire to. And it's cool to see that as Acuna is ascending again here in 2023, and he likely is going to be the NL MVP, that this card's following suit and the hobby is showing that confidence. Absolutely. And with about 615 PSA 10s and a value of about $1,400, I mean, that puts the market cap for this card, which is just multiplying the number of PSA 10s times the last sold value. It puts it at about $862,000, which is a, a large market cap. Yeah, especially for, you know, uh, an ultra modern card with, you know, of of a player whose career has been on a roller coaster, that's that's a that's a that's a large mark. Speaking of uh, current players on roller coasters, let's talk about the uh, notable falling card that stood out to you this month. Yeah, so perhaps the sport that got the most overheated in 2021 was basketball, and so it's no surprise that we're seeing some shocking falls from that peak. And this is one of the players who's been most directly affected. And that is LaMelo Ball. So the card in question here, which is down 40% over the last month, is the 2020 Prism number 278 LaMelo Ball Purple Ice Parallel, which is numbered to 175 PSA 10. It's a population 29, beautiful card, and it last sold for $750 at the end of July. This is the lowest sale ever for this card <laughs> okay this is the lowest sale on record the highest sale on record was also the first sale of this card which was from april of 2021 which it's noteworthy that that's also when the peak for that acuna card was was april of 2021 it sold for twelve thousand one hundred dollars in april of 2021 and ever since it's just been if you the graph looks like a ski slope so it was 12,000, then in November 2021, it was 8,000, then in January of 22, it was 5,000, in August of 2022, it was 3,000, you know, then you get to February of this year, it's 1,400, and now it's all the way down to $750. So it's come down a long ways, and it makes intuitive sense, LaMelo Ball was hurt, hasn't really been in the headlines. He's not playing with Team USA at FIBA. His brother's hurt, you know, uh, as well. It just, you, it, there's just not a lot of positive energy surrounding LaMelo Ball <laughs> right now, but that can change. That can, that can change in an instant. And as far as I can tell, he's still one of the most promising and most talented young players in the NBA. We just need to see him healthy and get him out there for a season. Yeah, and uh, it's funny. We were talking a little bit earlier. At, at what point does the price on this card get to the point where you're like, yeah, maybe it's uh, maybe I'd be prudent to go get one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty close to being there. I mean, this card at twelve thousand dollars is uh, not uh, in my lane, but this card at seven hundred fifty dollars, hey, that's kind of cool. If I was like walking the the floor at the national and I see a nice crisp PSA 10 purple ice of LaMelo from his rookie year at uh, seven. And like if the sticker on it is 750 bucks, I might take a flyer on something like that. And let's see how the first few months of the season. Go. I'll let the rising falling cards of uh, July, 2023 be a reminder that, you know, when the hobby is, this is one of the things that makes the hobby, you know, fun and, and can also make it challenging when you collect current players, but it, it, it is fun to take that ride with guys and, and, you know, with the downs come the ups. So this is, uh, we kind of covered the whole spectrum there. Yeah, we did. That's kind of looking ahead to the final segment of our show. The takeaways, that's something that's sort of standing out to me is that we covered in this episode, such a wide range of outcomes from you know, the, the, the puffed up prices of a, a football prospect and his prism one of one to Derek Jeter and beautiful nineties cards aging well to, you know, a super low pop third year of tops basketball, best rookie card from the set selling for over half a million 
you know, Messi in the twilight of his career, but coming abroad. Wembenyama also coming abroad, but in the early parts of his career, two different trajectories at the moment, and also probably two different trajectories over the longer term as well. We've got, you know, the baseball, the 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 young player returning to dominance as an MVP in Acuna and LaMelo Ball sort of out of sight, out of mind. I mean, there's just this hobby is so complex. There's so many different things all happening at the same time. There, it's really hard to generalize it. You know, if you survey this, sometimes it feels like the hobby is in the greatest place it's ever been based on what we just talked about. And other times it's, it's terrifying. And, I, and you think about a card going from being worth $12,000 to $750. I mean, that just puts a pit in your stomach thinking about things like that happening to card value. So this hobby is very, it's a very dynamic place, Ryan. I think that's my takeaway. Um, and, uh, you know, doubling down on something we talked about earlier, boy, high grade, I appeal vintage. If, uh, if that's, if that's your lane, boy, it's, it, it can be much smoother sailing and there's just, uh, you know, there's no shortage of cool stuff out there. It, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about that pistol Pete Maravich, uh, sale we discussed and, you know, look, obviously going out and picking up a, uh, a half million dollar card is not in the in the cards for many of us, but um, it is really cool to see that at the bedrock, as the bedrock of everything in this hobby, um, there's this really, there's just this wealth of really cool, high eye appeal, beautiful vintage out there that uh, I think is just it, it. It never it never ceases to amaze me um, how desired and and how much of like you said earlier a vote of confidence for the hobby, you know, notable sales in that arena. Yes, indeed, man. Um, There's, there's a lot of rich history in the sets of this hobby. When you talk about vintage and you just sort of think about how 1970 tops was the third ever basketball set that tops made. And then you go back all the way to 1948 Bowman, which was the first ever major release of a basketball set. And you have the, the, the Mike and, from that set, Golden currently has a mic in at auction that's already well over any previous rec- any previous record highs for the grade. You know the mic in PSA ten. I mean that card is a is is probably worth millions right now. That's certainly where the card letter value puts it at. And it's just you know Mike in is a name that I won't ever hear if I turn on ESPN or Fox Sports One or I listen to my daily digest of basketball podcasts. But the hobby doesn't forget. The hobby loves its original sets. The hobby loves the goats. The hobby loves history. And it's pretty cool to see how there's a lane for that. There's a lane for everything in this hobby. Yep. Great reminder of that from July 2023. Well, this was a a great overview at the month that was outside of the national uh, in the hobby, July 2023, that is. Chris McGill, I'm Ryan Green. We're going to be back with another episode of The Index next month, looking back on August 2023, and we'll be back with more of the PSA pod in between. Thank you for tuning in. We will talk to you next time.